We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. Welcome, everybody. Steve with Sense Fidelity. I'm coming at you with a special guest, Professor David Beggerberg of Nor. Uh, I was going to say North Dakota, Notre Dame. How did I screw that one up? Anyways, uh, pro- retired professor. Professor, how you doing? I'm fine, thanks. They're both ND, and uh, sometimes when I do a quick search, I get sent to the wrong university too. But uh, I know the only I thing am. I got on North Dakota is in junior college. We that was my our last, our second to last, our first loss was against North, uh, North Dakota State, and they just uh, uh, shot us out of the building that day. And uh, oh, yeah, so North Dakota is always on my mind for that reason. It's not ND, but ND's making a comeback. So, anyways. So I was listening to a podcast by Father David Abernathy, and he mentioned a certain book that a certain professor, who we might or might not have on this program, has written back in the day on liturgical asceticism. So I heard it. There's just a little clip that he read from it, interested me in it, because I was reading other stuff that he was recommending on basically on the church fathers, desert fathers in general. And I had to look this guy up. So who is he? Where is he? Is he still around? Does he is he interested in talking about this? And lo and behold, I found him. So thank you. Thank you for writing the book one. And I know I'm just getting around to it a decade later, but what is it? Why what made you get what what inspired you to write this book anyways? Hmm. Uh, my field is liturgical studies, but more specifically liturgical theology. Um you can do all sorts of things in the field of studying liturgy, and most people do uh, history, uh, liturgiology, historical. Uh, the second biggest group of people do uh, ritual studies. Uh, how is this done? But I was always interested in uh, liturgical theology. My uh, doctor father, dissertation advisor, was Aidan Kavanaugh, and he wasn't teaching my uh, first year there. He was uh, acting dean. And so I begged him for a uh, uh, directed readings. And he said, uh, okay, if we read everything we can lay our hands on by Alexander Schmemann, who was an Orthodox uh, theologian, priest, professor up at St. Vladimir's, uh, Kavanaugh was just absorbing this material himself. And he wanted, to, if I was going to be with him, he wanted to Uh, chatted over. Well, that led me to my dissertation uh, three going on four decades ago, uh, simply titled, What is Liturgical Theology? That's the only question that I wanted to answer myself. And my uh, feeling was that they had taught me something which was missing when I tried to explain to others what liturgical theology is. Uh, I had to thicken the uh, definition of liturgy. And so I would try to push it down into uh, understanding what liturgia was. Uh, then I thought I had to also thicken the definition of theology and uh, push it down into a theologia. Well, what was the thickening agent, the flour for the gravy that would uh, make liturgical theology make more sense? And I discovered that it was uh, asceticism. I'm uh, myself a Latin Catholic, but was engaged in reading uh, Orthodox authors about liturgy, and it led me to uh, Orthodox uh, classic studies in uh, patristics on asceticism and contemporary um, Orthodox writers on asceticism. So that uh, leads me to back to the uh, gate of uh, Schmemann. He said that liturgical theology is rediscovering a connection between three things, liturgy, theology, and he says piety, but I kind of substitute the word uh, 
ascetical spirituality in that third. Liturgical theology is rediscovering the connection between those three, which uh, we've lost. There's been a, a diver, di divorce or maybe a trivorce. The three of them have separated from one another. So for me, uh, the ascetical element uh, makes sense out of uh, liturgy and out of theology and out of liturgical theology. For the average Joe out there that may or may not, first off, let's say, uh, full disclosure, guys, uh, when we say Orthodox guys, they are ours. The uh, those those Eastern fathers, they're Catholic. They're us. They're it's we're worried about the split in the 11th century. Most of these guys that uh, he's writing about are prior to that split, aka ergo they're Catholic. Uh, just getting out there in case anybody starts getting worried about things. But right. Professor, what is for the average Joe? What is asceticism? Some some people out there, especially the Latin Rite Catholics, probably have no clue what that is. Uh, I bet they do have a clue what it is. They just don't know the term or right. the word. Uh, Eschesis is a Greek word that uh, simply and basically means uh, discipline or training or practice. Uh, I would joke with my undergrads in class that uh, it's uh, February uh, next month. Baseball players will start heading to Florida for their spring eschesis. Yes. They go down for their spring training. So the word was first used about athletes. They uh, underwent an asceticism. The uh, Notre Dame football team comes back uh, two weeks early each year for their ascesis. Then the uh, philosophers picked it up and began talking about a training of the spirit, training of the mind, uh, control of um, behaviors and appetites. And then the uh, Christian theologians picked it up, but revised exactly what the Greeks were doing with it. Sometimes ascesis could sound like it was uh, freeing the soul from the body, but that, of course, would not ever wash in um, uh, Christian theology. So uh, what I'm trying to explore in the book is an explanation of how Asceticism is a uh, discipline or training. Here comes Lent. We're going to undergo a uh, 40 days of ascesis again. And my interest is that it's not done just for moral reasons to make me a gooder person. You can use bad grammar to try to get your point across. Um, it's not just for um, cultural purposes or whatnot. Uh, a liturgical asceticism would be an asceticism that is uh, designed to uh, increase, insist, uh, assist, strengthen one's liturgy. Uh, here's an example that I use. Uh, one sort of discipline that one might uh, impose on oneself would be a kind of fasting. Yeah. There's all kinds of reasons to fast. The athlete fasts. He's on a special diet. The uh, magazines encourage uh women to fast in order to uh, meet their standards. Uh, there's medical reasons to fast before a blood test or if your uh, cholesterol is too high. Well, just as a uh, medicinal fast, a medical fast and a uh, athletic fast are different according to their uh, purpose, uh, their origin and their end. So I would also think to say that a liturgical fast is different because of its origin and its end. Uh, what's the purpose? What's the end? What's this uh, asceticism for? It's to uh, make us better liturgists. Well, that's already indicating then that uh, liturgist isn't just the person uh, directing the choir or uh, organizing the ushers. Uh, all people are baptized into this liturgical identity I think all people are baptized in, with this uh, ascetical requirement placed upon them. I think it's uh, all Christians are ascetics. Yeah, I can't remember the the, uh, the church father said it, but basically said that all holiness is for everybody. It's not yeah. just for the monk and the cleric and things like that. And you have the uh, what is what is it? The lack laic? How you pronounce that? That's in your I, I say laic. Laic. Yeah. It was the lay, lay cleric in a sense, not ordained, but you're doing stuff like this to, to make yourself holier. Because you would uh, distinguish a cleric from a lay person, but wait a minute, what are the monks in the desert? Uh, they're not ordained, many of them, most of them. 
Uh, so you might need another word for this third group. There's the professional ascetic in the desert. There's the ordained cleric. And then there's a Christian who's living in the world, who's uh, living his or her Christianity in the world. And um, uh, in one of the books I was reading, they uh, used the term laic as in a uh, person who is a lay cleric, a person who is uh, clerical. And I like that notion. There's a, a monastic asceticism and there's a lay asceticism. Oh, but the monks are lay people. So, okay, a laic asceticism. One of the, uh, two of the people I was reading said, uh, everybody is baptized a an ascetic, but there are two vowed um, states, two states of life where there's a vow associated with that asceticism. And they said it's monasticism and marriage. Well, that kind of fascinated me and it made a little chapter in a, a different book that we're not talking about. I think that asceticism was perfected in the sands of the desert, but it's born in the waters of the baptismal font. This is also uh, Aidan Kavanaugh ringing in my ears again. Uh, he, he spoke about liturgical theologians and called Mrs. Murphy a liturgical theologian. Uh, what? She's a theologian and she hasn't even uh, been to uh, Notre Dame and done her master's degree? Yeah, that's right. You're a theologian if you're engaged and formed and shaped by the liturgy, a liturgical theologian. So Mrs. Murphy, I've been uh, following up on Kavanaugh and I say uh, Mrs. Murphy is a liturgical theologian, though not of the academic kind. Mrs. Murphy is an ascetic, though not of the monastic kind. Mrs. Murphy is a mystic, though not of the extraordinary kind. Uh, my interest is in uh, getting liturgy, theology, and asceticism uh, to be reclaimed as the birthright of all the uh, baptized Christians. And I guess that's another one we could think of is, can the West incorporate these Eastern ideas, kind of like... Uh... The Easterns, you hear more of a, they're myst, more mystical in a sense. Well, the land, we're mystic too. We just don't, do we just yeah. poo-poo it or just kind of push it over to the side? And, uh, the asceticism, the hardcore stuff that these guys were doing, like the stylites in Ascension. John Cassian brought back to the Benedictine orders and uh, or the Benedict, St. Benedict picked up from Cass, Cassian, actually. Um, these things, like so we've seen Latin right guys take, incorporate the Eastern mentality into our right. Is this something we just lost? We just need to refine. Uh, multiple uh, answers to your profound question, complex question. <laughs> On the one hand, uh, I'm cautious about uh, just cutting and pasting from uh, east to west. Uh, words operate within a certain grammar, within a certain culture, within a certain uh, trajectory and tradition. And so uh, one is kind of careful about just picking it up and dropping it in another location. Uh, maybe we're uh, not treating it fairly. But there have been uh, a number of studies lately uh, indicating that this uh, ascetical spirituality and the struggle towards an end which the East calls deification is also... Um, uh, prevalent in the West. It's just sometimes under a different vocabulary. Um, I've always noted this paragraph in 15 in uh, Second Vatican Council's document, uh, Unitatus Red Integratio. It says, quote, Catholics are earnestly recommended to avail themselves of the spiritual riches of the Eastern Fathers, which lift up the whole man to the contemplation of the divine. The very rich liturgical and spiritual heritage of the Eastern churches should be known, venerated, preserved, and cherished by all. And they must recognize that this is of supreme importance for the faithful preservation of the fullness of Christian tradition and for bringing about reconciliation between Eastern and Western Christians. Well, when I read that, I thought to myself, I want to avail myself of spiritual riches, and I want to be lifted up to the contemplation of the divine. And I want to know and venerate and preserve and cherish the heritage of liturgy and spirituality and the fullness of the Christian tradition. So uh, I'll look over the fence sometimes to the pastors of the East. 
Uh, can it be used? I think it well can. I joked uh, when I finished this book that I should write a second volume using this time only Western sources. I try to use almost exclusively Eastern sources uh -huh. in uh, this first book. And uh, that's the thing that I've been working on now for the last five years, uh, picking up Western theologians. I call them theologians of abnegation. And I've just zeroed in on um, post-Reformation. I like the uh, fathers. I like the medieval scholastics and monastics, but I never had much um, to do with the uh, Catholic spiritual authors from 1500 to 1900. And well, as I'm reading them, this uh, insight of liturgical asceticism uh, uh, brings me uh, clarity and uh, it's there. I do searches for uh, terms and uh, classic Eastern ascetical authors, John Climacus appears uh, dozens of times in uh, uh, scores of the books. Yes. Uh, I did a search for uh, the word deification and it shows up numerous times. They probably could have been using a different word and this is an English a, a translation into English, but that's uh, the one they've chosen. Uh, so this interests me. Uh, I don't know if I'm um, talking too much, but could I do an anecdote with you just yeah, to make the point? Yeah. Um, one of these Western theologians of abnegation, as I classify them, was uh, Francois Fenelon. And uh, years ago, I made a uh, retreat at a Eastern Rite Catholic monastery in Redwood, Cal Redwood Valley, California, Holy Transfiguration Monastery. And I uh, brought away some prayer books from that community. And even when some other prayers dropped from a morning schedule, I used to continue this one. I'm going to recite it because I found that a good number of people recognize it. They've heard of it, heard it, maybe use it. This is the prayer. O oh Lord, grant me to greet the coming day in peace. Help me in all things to rely upon your holy will. In every hour of the day, reveal your will to me. Bless my dealings with all who surround me. Teach me to treat all that comes to me throughout the day with peace of soul and with firm conviction that your will governs all. In all my deeds and words, guide my thoughts and feelings. In unforeseen events, let me not forget that all are sent by you. Teach me to act firmly and wisely without embittering and embarrassing others. Give me strength to bear the fatigue of the coming day with all that it shall bring. Direct my will, teach me to pray, and you yourself pray in me. Well, that prayer has always had associations with the East for me because I discovered it at the Byzantine Catholic Monastery, but also because that prayer, if you uh, do a search for it, is attributed to Philaret of Moscow. It's commonly called the Prayer of St. Philaret of Moscow or the Morning Prayer of the Optina Elders. Now, in 2020, I spoke at the uh, symposium at the Eighth Day Institute in Wichita, Kansas. I was presenting a uh, paper on Lieberman. And I went uh, next uh, down the block next door to the uh, Eighth Day Bookstore, which has taken its share of my budget uh, over the years. And I uh, was startled to find an icon of this very prayer. Um, and as the uh, clerk was wrapping it up, he said, that was written by Fenelon, didn't you know? I said, you're kidding. Fenelon had made this impact on one lobe of my brain, and this prayer uh, resided in the other lobe of my brain, so it sent me to do some researching. And here was an explanation from uh, Thomas Hopko, Dean Emeritus of St. Vladimir's Seminary. And he... Uh, recounts being introduced to Fenelon in A Course on Spirituality. He writes, one interesting thing about Fenelon is that he was known by St. Philaret of Moscow, and there are two prayers of Fenelon that Philaret translated into Russian and became very popular, and they became popular in America, the SBCK Orthodox Prayer Book. But in fact, Philaret did not write them, Fenelon did. Philaret took them over totally intact, word for word, and he published them in the Russian language, for the Russian people to pray these prayers. Conclusion, for me, two worlds did not collide 
two worlds melded. I didn't mix them on my own effort by intellectual cleverness. They were mixed on the level of affection in me. And I had to ask myself, are these two streams coming from the same source or is it the same stream coming down two sources? I think there is opportunity for ecumenical conversation on spiritual matters, on liturgical asceticism, that may be the uh, best place to start in our conversation with our uh, Eastern brothers and sisters. And then, of course, the uh, Eastern Rite Catholics uh, have a unique role to play in this because they um, uh, live in those two worlds. So I'm uh, revisiting the material now uh, and uh, trying to rewrite uh, the same thing about asceticism using Western authors. And maybe we can get it published as a volume two. Uh, I have to find somebody. You're going to, I dog eared that you know what out of this book, by the way. It's it's almost doubled in size. Uh, when you brought up Climacus, he's almost on every other page. Uh, it seems like to me. But, anyways, one of the projects, I, one of the ideas I had was. Let me see if he would be up for doing uh, like shows on this, explaining that in more detail or in a detail different what the book is, a little bit more explanation in a sense. And you've graciously done that. We've done three episodes. We'll unlock them later after this. Um, can you explain the project? Yes. Um, about 15 years ago, I discovered a, a Microsoft application called OneNote. And everybody's got it because if they own uh, Office, it's just that uh, people don't think to uh, open it. OneNote lets me uh, put material in a, a file on a screen. But besides the uh, text, you can put in pictures. You can organize it into columns. Uh, you can put in links and jump from one spot to another. And I started using this OneNote to give my lectures in class plug my uh, iPad in and project it on the screen behind me. And it came to a point where I no longer thought about what could I say in class today. I would think, what could I show them in class today? Yeah. Uh, here's a quote that I want to do. At first, it felt to me like I was not only uh, cutting up their food as a mom does for her toddler, but chewing it uh, for the students. Don't you have to do some work and take notes? <laughs> But they persuaded me that if they knew they could get that paragraph quote by Augustine later, they took different kinds of notes at the time. So I uh, lectured with the OneNote material. Well, I've got all this material then uh, on uh, Evagrius and on asceticism and on uh, John Cassian and Mary and Martha, vices and virtues, passions, logismoi, and um, I found a way to uh, take myself uh, off the center of the screen and put my uh, face down in the corner and put the OneNote material up front and center. And that's what I'm uh, doing in these presentations. It's uh, very gratifying to me to have uh, a little bit of classroom experience again now that I'm retired. I'm happy with my retirement. I traded in department meetings for play dates with my grandchildren. But uh, sitting here in the office reading and writing, I kind of miss thinking through the thoughts again out loud. That's why one becomes a teacher. So uh, your uh, gracious invitation was something I was uh, happy to do. And I'm trying to keep it um, informational and uh, not deadly dull um, and to show uh, material. So I've got um, many things and you and I will have to negotiate uh, how many will uh, just try dropping another pebble in the pond and see if it also makes ripples. Yeah, anybody knows me, you know, they're going to say, Steve's going to have you, whatever you want to do, just send it and I will post it, post it up. <laughs> You've got a huge website. I was shocked. Well, that's the whole, the whole purpose of that is major. Now they, I, I tell everyone I gave priests a, a megaphone to get the sermons out there. And now, like a professor like yourself, that got all this information out there that used to have a classroom, maybe 20, 30, 50, maybe 100. Now you got a couple hundred thousand for you. And so, megaphone for you know people like yourselves. So I'm just happy you were great, you did it. And I was, I listened to a couple going, man, this is fantastic. And all of our friends I sent it to are off the bat. We haven't unlocked it yet, like I said, but they have all been like, where's this been? And uh, anyway, just a big thank you for doing that. 
My pleasure. The um, material always changes uh, to me according to the context, whether I'm doing masters or undergrads, whether it's a parish presentation. And here I'm uh, going over notes again, thinking about the video going up on census fidelium. And the uh, uh, second one that I did uh, wound up with some definitions of theology that come out of this ascetical tradition that uh, interests me. And one of them uh, at the end spoke about uh, people becoming theologian souls and theology actually being um, the uh, participating in the beaming rays of theology out into the world. I thought that's your description if you want another slogan, beaming yeah. rays of theology. These yeah. rays are to be beamed out into the world. Uh, that's what your website does. So uh, making theology available. Uh, liturgical theology. Mrs. Murphy is a theologian. Yeah. Uh, this is an academic theology. It's uh, heartfelt theology. It's uh, um, personal and spiritual theology. I think that was one of the lines one of the fathers said, if you're if you pray, you're you're a theologian. Not again, as you said, not a degree, but you're you're diving into the deification of yourself. Yeah. And um that's a famous quote from uh Evagrius, and that's treated in the first, no, the second lecture. But I was uh looking around in anticipation of our conversation, East and West, can they use it? And I, uh, one of the books that I've read in the Western Theologians of Abnegation was by uh, Giovanni Bona. He wrote a book titled Easy Way to God. And here he writes, uh, from this, the soul at length passes on to contemplation and reaches to mystical theology. St. Nihilus rightly says, if thou art a theologian, thou wilt pray truly. Wouldst thou be a theologian, pray truly, and a theologian thou wilt be. Now, he attributes it to Nihilus instead of Evagrius, and for some reasons that I explained. But here it is in this uh, Western uh, uh, Cardinal Bona uh, material. Uh, Mrs. Murphy learns to be a theologian by means of the formation she receives in liturgy. And the liturgy forms her into a prayer, teaches her prayer, and that's a, um, that's a kind of theology we're talking about here. For Evacrius, theology doesn't begin in the card catalog of the library. Theology begins with prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. That's good. Uh, that's, Father Abernathy's brought that up a couple of times. You're not, we're not looking for uh, degrees here. We're looking for hearts to change. Not You don't have to be the greatest mind in the planet. You just... It's the love and devotion. I think it was it your book that brought up Martha and Mary saying, "We need we need both." Uh, Martha, yeah. Martha needs Mary. Mary needs Martha. Yeah, I'm reading a uh, Franciscan mystic of the 15th or 14th century now, and he says, uh, "You need a left arm and a right arm." Uh, intellect has its questions, you have to answer them, but the other is uh, knowing not by mind, but by taste. Yeah. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And if you used only one, uh, you would be like someone in a rowboat using only one oar. Yeah. So there you go, round and around and around. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there are uh, important um, questions for Mrs. Murphy to ask and getting... Um, advice and uh, uh, information from the theological tradition is important. And that's uh, material that you provide. But the theology comes at the end of this uh, ascetical uh, process of discipline. And I think the whole thing is a liturgical event. So that makes me expand liturgy beyond the walls of the temple. You must uh, liturgize each day of your life. So for me, all of this uh, wraps up together. Hmm. Amen to that. And uh, again, of course, the link for now his book on liturgical asceticism is printed by published by the Catholic University of America Press. It'll be underneath in the show notes. I have it underneath in each of the lectures as well. I promise, you, get the book. You're gonna love it. Uh, it it was a page turn. I had to I had to sit it down because I was going through it so fast. But anyway, yeah. solid, great book. Uh, well done. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing the other one, the next next one of yours come out on the uh, 
the Western ones. But Professor, appreciate your time. Thank you for doing this. And uh, yeah, no, just again, big thank you. Thanks very much. My pleasure.